regulatory fundamentals. This section lays the groundwork. We discuss who must be an associated person. We discuss the requirements for broker-dealers. Let's begin by discussing FINRA. FINRA writes your test. FINRA stands for the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. FINRA exists so that broker-dealer firms have a place to communicate with each other. FINRA requires things like arbitration. FINRA has rules of conduct that will highlight things you should never do within the securities industry. FINRA requires that broker-dealers all are members of FINRA, including every broker-dealer's branch office. The definition of a branch office is any location identified by any means to the public as a location in which the member conducts an investment banking or securities business. So FINRA basically oversees the entire securities industry. FINRA requires registration and fingerprinting of all firm principals and their registered reps. Fingerprint records under FINRA rules must be kept for at least three years after termination of employment. This section has a lot of rules. So it references not only FINRA rules in the outline, it references federal securities laws as well. The test would like you to be aware of what is called a registered securities association. Here in the United States, FINRA is currently the only registered securities association. So let's just kind of give you an overview of, of how the industry is laid out. So FINRA was created by consolidating the regulatory arms of what was the NASD and the New York Stock Exchange. So they combined efforts and FINRA was born in July of 2007. So when FINRA was first created, the intent was they were going to take all of the former NASD rules, all of the NYSC rules, and make a consolidated rule book. It was going to be done by 2010. But then the Great Recession came passage of Dodd-Frank legislation. Lots of things have happened to hold up this consolidated rule book process. So FINRA is still working on consolidating the rules. So you'll see throughout the course that I will reference sometimes NASD rules or NYSE rules. It's not that <laughs> I've lost my mind, which, you know, sometimes it feels like maybe that's possible. It's that there's really still NASD rules on the outline because they're still in existence because we have not yet adopted a new FINRA rule. So it's not a big deal. Just, just know that sometimes I will reference those rules and, and that that is intentional. Never is this test a test on can you match uh, what is NASD rule 2150 with, with what it really is. It's not that kind of a test. So even though I will reference lots of rule numbers throughout the course, it's don't worry, don't make flashcards and memorize what they match up with. It's, it's just not that kind of test. So I mentioned that FINRA is a registered securities association. So historically, we call it an SRO, FINRA, a self-regulatory organization. So if you think about it, it's kind of a unique industry, the securities industry. We have federal securities laws, which of course are enforced by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And then we have all of these really trading rules, uh, cooperation rules, how do member firms work together, and those are all enforced by FINRA. There's, of course, state securities law as well that is enforced by the state securities administrator. So, so FINRA overseeing the entire securities industry requires that all, let's see how the rule is actually written, all member firms, broker dealers, which we'll discuss the definition of this momentarily, must be registered with a SRO. So with a self-regulatory organization, which in the United States really is FINRA. It's not, there's no other one to really join. So all broker-dealers must 
register with FINRA. So must register with FINRA. And then here you are. So the broker dealer is the firm level, right? So this is the firm. And then here you are taking your series six exam. And you are, of course, an individual. And you will be soon called a registered representative. And we sometimes use the term associated member, associated person, associated person, associated person of a member firm. And we'll talk about that definition as well. So the individual is the registered rep. To have a Series 6 license, you have to be working for a broker-dealer. You can't be a registered rep without that affiliation. You must be uh, working for a broker-dealer. And then we mentioned this idea that all individuals so principal is your boss. A principal overseeing you with your Series 6 would have their Series 26 license. And all registered persons at that firm must get their fingerprints done. And then those fingerprints are maintained on file by the member firm for three years after termination of employment. So the test does definitely like that rule. So within FINRA, we have uh, rules. We have what happens if you break the rules. Uh, we call that the code of procedure. We have arbitration requirements. We, we even have a, what's called a code of mediation as well. Within the FINRA bylaws, we have the definition of who is a person associated with a member or an associated person of a member. Who is this? A natural person who is registered it's you, actually. It includes a sole proprietor, partner, officer, director, or branch manager of a member, or other natural person occupying a similar status, or performing similar functions, or a natural person engaged in the investment banking or securities business who is directly or indirectly controlling or controlled by a member. So the member, that's the firm, that's the broker dealer. It also includes within the term person associated with a member, any other person listed in Schedule A of what's called Form BD. So I want to introduce some of these forms and then we'll see them again and again and again throughout this discussion. So we have for a broker dealer, when they want to become a broker dealer, a form filed, the form has to be filed electronically through what's called the CRD, which stands for Central Registration Depository. So Form BD is for the firm to register. In order for you to register, it's called a Form U4. So hopefully, when you're here listening to this class, you've already filed through your firm electronically, of course, Form U4. It's the registration form to be an associated person. Granted, you have to pass the qualification exam, which is why you're stuck here listening to me. So Form U4 is the paperwork that applies you for registration, all filed electronically through this Central Registration Depository. So who is eligible to become members and associated persons of members under FINRA bylaws? It includes any registered broker, dealer, municipal securities broker or dealer, or government securities broker or dealer authorized to transact and whose regular course of business consists in actually transacting any branch of the investment banking or securities business in the United States. They shall be eligible for membership in FINRA. So broker-dealers must register with FINRA. You must register with FINRA. Ineligibility for certain people. No registered broker, dealer, municipal securities broker or dealer, or government securities broker or dealer shall be admitted to membership and no member shall be continued in membership if any of these things become true. So these are reasons why FINRA can deny a registration 
or could suspend a registration or revoke a registration. These are just some of the reasons. Fails or ceases to satisfy the qualification requirements, if applicable. So to have a Series 6 license, you have to pass your Series 6 test with a 70% or better, which you will. If a person becomes subject to a disqualification, which I will talk about momentarily, or fails to comply with the requirements that all forms be filed via an electronic process. There's no more paper U4 forms that can be submitted. Back in the day, everything was done on paper. No longer. If FINRA deems it, it appropriate, they may, upon notice and opportunity for a hearing, so that's important. You're never going to get a letter from FINRA that says, hey, we canceled your membership. They have to give you notice, you have to have a hearing. FINRA may cancel the membership of a member if it becomes uh, ineligible for continuance in membership due to any of those situations. So FINRA can cancel your membership as an associated person and your firms. No person shall become associated with a member, continue to be associated with a member, or transfer association to another member if such person fails or ceases to satisfy the qualification requirements, and that's really that you filed the paperwork and you've passed the test, or if such person is or becomes subject to a disqualification. So what is this disqualification that I've mentioned? The test loves this idea. So a person is subject to disqualification with respect to membership or association with a member if such person is subject to any what they call statutory disqualification. So statutory disqualification includes a person that has been convicted within 10 years of any securities related crime. So there's this idea under statutory disqualification So there's certain things that if they are true, you will not be able to be a registered person, an associated person of a member. Statutory disqualification. So any securities related crime in the past 10 years. So this number for sure you have to know. So if it was securities related and it was 12 years ago, well then you're okay. Mm, seems so strange, <laughs> but, but it really is how the rules work. What else, however, would qualify someone for statutory disqualification? Any person who did something wrong on purpose, so willful violation of any federal securities law. It's one thing to do something wrong and then find out you did something wrong, meaning you didn't know what you were doing was prohibited. There's a whole different thing that happens if somebody premeditates, breaks the rules on purpose. So willful violation. Or a person has been expelled or suspended from any SRO. And really the main SRO in the securities industry that we talk about is FINRA. So a person that's been expelled or suspended from FINRA, that's considered statutory disqualification, or a person that is subject to an order denying, suspending, or revoking registration. So those are all within that definition of statutory disqualification. So you can't be a registered rep if any of those are true. FINRA bylaws also specifically describe what the qualification requirements are. No member shall permit any person associated with the member to engage in the investment banking or securities business unless the member determines that such person satisfies the qualification requirements established by Section 2, which I'll cover in a minute, and the person is not subject to a disqualification. So if they hired an intern, the broker dealer hired an intern, the intern cannot engage in the securities business unless they're properly registered. Even if the intern's not getting paid, they must be properly registered. So sometimes that will come up on the test and it feels funny, I think. Sometimes we think, oh, well, we, we don't pay them. <laughs> it doesn't matter. If they're engaged in the securities business, they must be properly licensed. So they start by filling out 
form U4, which I mentioned. So form U4 is the form for you. It is signed by the applicant, granted it's all done electronically. For the firm, what do they do to register? File, form, yep, BD. And then there's one more that I want to introduce to you that kind of goes along with all these registration forms. So form U4, that's the one that you do to be a registered rep. Form BD is the form filed by your firm, by your broker dealer. And then there's a new term uh, that you may or may not have heard before and that's uh, what's called an investment advisor. So the investment advisor is actually a firm level distinction and the investment advisor fills out what's called form ADV. So firm. Similar to a broker dealer is a firm, an investment advisor is a firm. And in this section we will talk about the Investment Advisors Act of 1940 and I'll give you all sorts of definitions. But the basic idea behind this is that any firm that sells investment advice gives investment advice, uh, charges a fee for it. So whether or not it's a flat fee or a percentage of assets managed, the firm must be registered as an investment advisor. And that form is actually not filed through the CRD, it's instead filed through what's called the IARD, which stands for Investment Advisor Registration Depository. It's done in an electronic process as well. So these are registration forms. FINRA rules require that every application for registration be kept current at all times by amendments that are to be made electronically. Such amendments to the application must be filed no later than 30 days after learning of the facts or circumstances giving rise to the amendment. For example, you're a registered rep and you take a part-time job on the side. It requires an amendment to be filed to your U4 form. So, when do amendments have to be filed? Promptly, within 30 days. Within 30 days. With one exception. So we mentioned the definition of statutory disqualification. If the amendment has to do with statutory disqualification, then that amendment must be filed within 10 days of when the disqualification occurred. So within 30 days is the default, but if it has to do with statutory disqualification, then you have to tell them faster than the rule is within 10 days. So statutory disqualification is a faster requirement. U4 is the form that you as a registered rep file for registration. Sometimes you will leave your firm Maybe you decide to leave the investment banking business for a while. Maybe you get fired. Maybe you found a new firm to go work for that you like better. There's all sorts of different reasons. The test will want you to be aware of the process. What is filed? So Form U4 is the form that you file that applies you for registration. So Form U4 applies you for registration and you're registered because you filed this form and you're registered as an associated person of a member, you have to have a broker-dealer. I can't go take the Series 6 test whenever I feel like it because you have to have a firm that you're going to be working for in order to go and take this test. Now, if I am terminated, then there's a different form that's filed, which of course the test would like you to know as well, and that's Form U5. So this will take down my registration with the firm. The U5 filing must be done within 30 days. So Form U4 applies me for registration, and Form U5 really resigns me from registration. So it must be filed within 30 days of when I was terminated. 
It's also required that the broker-dealer firm give the associated person that has left the firm a copy of the Form U-5 filing. It's all done electronically, of course. If there is a complaint pending against me, FINRA will hold off on processing my Form U-5. So that termination of registration will not take effect if there is a complaint or action against me. Because there is a statute of limitations for how long FINRA has authority over me once I have resigned my registration. So they will hold that uh, U-5 filing if there is a complaint pending against me. How long does FINRA maintain jurisdiction over a person who has terminated registration? So person being either a member firm or being an individual. So U5 filed to terminate an individual's registration. Uh, we talked about Form BD applies the broker-dealer, Form BD. The form that the firm would file to terminate their registration is called Form BDW. W standing for withdrawal. So how long does FINRA maintain jurisdiction over a person, broadly defined, whose registration has been terminated? Two years after the effective date of termination, whether or not it was revoked or canceled, or two years after the date upon which a person ceased to be associated with the member. So this is the statute of limitations that I was talking about. So FINRA retains jurisdiction over that person who's no longer the associated person for two years. So retains jurisdiction for two years. What else does the test want you to know in this area? You file U5, resigns your registration because FINRA maintains jurisdiction over you after you've left for two more years, your U-5 must be filed with any name or address changes for a period of two years after the U-5 has been filed. Name and or address changes. So that seems kind of weird. That once you've resigned, you still have to notify FINRA of any name or address changes for two years. But these two things go together. So goes together with this idea that FINRA retains jurisdiction over you for two years. It also ties with something else coming up here in just a minute. If I'm working at a broker-dealer firm and I'd like to leave, what form do I file? Well, my firm files for me, gives me a copy of it. Form U5. I can never just transfer registration. I would go to my new firm and I'd start from scratch. I'd fill out a new U4 form. So U5 would be filed with my old firm within 30 days of when I left. I would file a new U4 with my new broker-dealer. You can't just transfer registrations. Let's say I did a U5 filing and I've left the firm. I update my name and address change for a period of how long? Two years. Retains, FINRA retains jurisdiction over me for also two years. And something really important for you to know, once you have filed a U-5 filing, you have a period of two years to reapply for registration without having to take this test again. So oh, I can't tell you how many people I've had come through class whose registration has been terminated for two years and two weeks. And here they are back taking the test again, starting over from scratch. Also something the test will definitely want you to know. So you have two years from when the U-5 form was filed to reapply. Maybe you go back to the old firm. Maybe you get a new firm without having to retest. After two years, it's kind of like you're just starting all over from scratch, from the very beginning. Come see me. Should that ever happen, I'll still be around. Different types of exams that are administered by FINRA. They administer over 30 different qualification exams besides just this Series 6 test. So your Series 6 test is to be this limited lines registered rep. You can't sell everything, but you can sell mutual funds and variable products. So this is you, Series 6, 
mutual funds and variable products. So you can sell variable life insurance, variable annuities, if you have also a life insurance license. So this is one of the tests that you can take. I referenced this before. Your principal, your boss, has a series 26. So this is a principal license. People also will come through classes and get potentially their Series 7 license. So Series 7 is a course that we offer as well. This is a stockbroker. So stockbrokers sell securities both in the primary and secondary market. Stocks and bonds, where with your Series 6, you're, you're limited to what you can sell. The person that oversees the stockbroker has their Series 24. So the Series 24 test is a principal license. So if you have your 24 license, you could oversee people with their Series 6 and their Series 7. If you have your 26 license, you can only oversee people that have their Series 6. So both 26 and 24 courses we offer, they are law courses. So if you think this one has a lot of law, those ones have even more law. You can do it though. You can do it. Come back and see me. I'll help you through it. And then I talked about Form ADV and I said that was a form that's filed by a firm called an investment advisor. Sometimes you'll get your Series 6 and then your firm will ask you to also get what's called a Series 65. So the Series 65 is a license that allows you to become what's called an investment advisor representative. So an investment advisor representative represents an investment advisor. So it's actually the individual that is giving the investment advice. So Series 65 is the test that you would take when you have your Series 6. I teach that class, so absolutely promise me that you'll see me for that because that is a heck of a test. So when you get your Series 6, when you get your 26, when you get your 24, when you get your 7, all of these, you are representing your broker-dealer, right? So broker-dealer. Where the Series 65 license, you are an associated person of an investment advisor. Now, some broker-dealers are also investment advisors, but not all. Sometimes a broker-dealer and investment advisor are two totally separate entities. And then people that have their Series 7 license to charge a fee for, an invest, for investment advice, take either the 65 or they can take what's called a 66 test. 65 is the one that I would always recommend for anyone because in my humble opinion, I believe it's a slightly easier test. But the only people that can take this 66 are those that have their seven. So when you're getting your series six, as you are, if you need to be an investment advisor representative, then you'll take your series 65 test next. So those are just a handful of the different tests that FINRA writes and administers. So if the only type of security that you are going to be selling is redeemable securities of companies that are registered under the Investment Company Act of 1940, then you need to have your Series 6 license. So this is just an introduction Investment Company Act of 1940. So the Investment Company Act of 1940 breaks down three different categories of investment companies. So we've got management companies. All mutual funds are management companies. There's what are called face amount certificate companies, and there are unit investment trusts. This is just a brief introduction. It's covered in much more detail later on in the course. There's different types of management companies. The most common discussed on this test are what are called open-end mutual funds. So open-end mutual funds are always new issues. You're always buying new shares. You can sell them with your Series 6 license. If someone has an open-end mutual fund share, they don't sell it to someone else. It is redeemable. 
So it's redeemed by the transfer agent. So you'll learn all about that in a subsequent section, I promise. But just this idea of the definition of who's eligible to get their Series 6 license is someone who sells redeemable securities of an investment company. It also includes securities of closed-end companies. So closed-end companies are mutual fund companies that sell a limited number of shares. With your Series 6 license, you can sell them when they're in their original distribution only, the, the law actually says. So it's when it's brand new that you can sell it. Closed and mutual fund shares, similar to exchange traded funds, trade in the secondary market after they're new. So in order to buy or sell anything in the secondary market for your client, you have to have a Series 7 license. So you can only sell closed and mutual funds when they're brand new. You can also sell variable contracts, which I discussed, so variable life insurance and variable annuities. So if you limit your activities to these things, pass your Series 6 test, you've filed a U4, there's nothing that requires you to be statutorily disqualified, then you can be an associated person with a member. Certain types of persons associated with a member are not required to be registered. So clerical staff, clerical staff is not engaged in the investment banking industry. So clerical staff is not an associated person. They're not required to be a registered person or any person associated with a member who's not actively engaged in the investment banking or securities business.